Hey legends, I'm Eliza Lee and you're listening to The Making of an Incredible MD, the podcast for aspiring medical professionals. Last season, we geared you up with a ton of different topics and ethical dilemmas to think about in the medical field. And on this season of the podcast, we're taking you behind the scenes of live MMI mock stations that we run for our students who are about to sit their med interviews. So stay tuned for a new station each week and hear a handful of our future med students give it a good old crack. Today on Station 12, we have one of our University of Melbourne examiners, Sanji, running a de-technicalized station with one of our aspiring med students, Zane. This is one of Zane's first attempts, so he decided not to record his response. So I'm going to just play the recording of Sanji giving feedback, and hopefully you have enough context. Sanji goes through some general pointers at the beginning and end, and if you're specifically after some advice on how to approach D-Tech stations, skip forward to about the five minute mark. And today the station that Zane read was this. Explain the term virus to a child prior to them getting a vaccination. And there were two follow-up questions, which were, what makes COVID-19 a virus? And why do some viruses lead to pandemics when others don't? So I'm not going to be acting like a 10-year-old, but I want you to explain it to me as if I'm a 10-year-old. De-technicalize it. So have a go at that station yourself and then continue with the recording really well for your first try I, like my first try at DTEC was horrible compared to this so just the first thing that I'd like to add is that usually when a interviewer asks you this question you'll be in the interview so still act as if like oh, I would like to go back to question one and I'm going to add a little bit to question one you know say that but remember that I'm still a 10 year old child So don't talk about it retrospectively, talk about it as if you're still in the interview. And remember that we're explaining this to a 10 year old child, right? So you don't need a detailed understanding. That's what DTEC is all about. A basic understanding can go a really long way. So basically that's all the feedback you need. No, I'm kidding. But like, <laughs> so the reason why I bring up like saying little jokes like this, okay, yeah. is because this is just really important when it comes to medicine as a whole. I'm going to be tying in a tidbits of feedback throughout this entire feedback session, but you're going into the business of healing people as a doctor. So you're not just healing their diseases with drugs. Like you're often basically the first port of call when someone's at their most vulnerable. So jokes can often go a really long way. You really just want to embody that empathy throughout your entire life. What I did when I was in my interviews is I had a rule. I would make at least two jokes during my MMI station. And the reason for that is because the interviewers, they've been sitting down at the same station, listening to the same answer again and again. You know, a little joke can go a long way. Okay, so now the reason why I really asked you about, you know, reflecting upon how you did, okay, and I know that this is your second time, so there's plenty of time to improve. During your actual interview, make sure that you're maintaining eye contact and you're looking at the screen that your webcam is on. So this has happened to me before. Like I've had students that I have been looking at a different monitor. 90% of people you'll find will end up blabbering out the right thing, but only 10% of people will say it well, okay? And it's that 10% that really end up getting into medicine. You need to be fluent and you need to be concise with your answers. And, you know, I'm going to be giving you feedback throughout this entire thing in order to improve. So let's begin with the actual content. DTEC is really all about analogies. You don't need an analogy. But if you can think of a good one, you're set. And you'll find that as you're going through, you know, trying to explain something, you always end up using analogies. So let's talk about how you approach the first question. So I think your communication was really good. I think at the start, you really tried to focus on the fact that, you know, this was a 10 year old kid and you try to make things simple. So a virus is very small. It makes you sick. And we're going to be giving you an injection called a vaccine that will prevent you from getting sick. So it's all good stuff. And I think that it was really good that you related it to the fact these are symptoms that a kid would know, right? This gives you the flu, it makes you sneeze, it makes you cough. And we're giving this in order to prevent it. Now, one thing that's really important and um, something that you should really focus on is look at what the question is directly asking you. So in this question, it was saying, explain the term virus to a child prior to them getting a vaccination. So I think that You did quickly kind of say what a virus is. It's small and makes you sick. But if I was a 10-year-old kid, I wouldn't really understand that that much. 
So this is where like something like an analogy comes in. So for example, you could just say that oh, a virus is a bug. It's a really small bug that you can't even see and it goes into your body and it makes you sick. And then you can add all that extra stuff that you said. So it makes you have a running nose and it makes, you know, makes you hot and have a fever and you don't feel good. So that's all great stuff to put into your answer. And I think a really good thing is that you actually looked at the question holistically rather than just looking at the word virus. So you talked about the fact that, you know, a kid is coming in and they're coming in to get a vaccine, right? So what that means is that they're probably scared. If they're 10 years old, they probably don't know why they're actually getting this. So taking the time to not only explain what a virus is, but the reason as to why they're getting a vaccine is a really good idea. And I think it's really good that you did that. Most people I don't think would do that. They would just explain what a virus is. So going that extra mile, taking that extra 20 seconds to explain not only what a virus is, but you know, comfort the kid as well as provide reasoning as to why you're giving the vaccine can help differentiate you from other students, gives you a little bit of dimensionality to your answer. So the second bit, right? What makes COVID-19 a virus? You basically did what you needed to do, right? So you need to draw comparisons between COVID-19 and what a virus is. That's what you did. You said it makes you sick and there's lots of different kinds of viruses. So those are all good points. But the thing is, is that remember that because I'm a 10 year old kid, there are some things that might just be above the scope of what I understand. Even the word saliva, some kids might not know what that is, right? So their entire life, they might've just called it spit or something like that. Another thing is that you said that, you know, there's lots of different types of viruses and they form, you know, new types of viruses. So I think you're alluding to mutations and things like that. But remember that for a kid, they probably don't need to understand mutations to that level. They just need to understand the basic comparison between what COVID-19 and what a virus is. It could go something along the lines of there's lots of different kinds of bugs which make you sick. Viruses are a specific kind of bug which makes you sick. And there's lots of different kinds of bugs. So a really good way is like once you get that analogy going, like a virus is a bug, it makes you sick, you can just spread that across all the questions that you need to go through. Another thing that you can add is that these viruses, for example, they jump between people really easily. And so that's why when you get sick, uh, sometimes your parents and your friends get sick too because they just jump between people. And basically COVID-19 does all of these things so it's a virus as well. Once again, it's just making that basic comparison and expanding it on a little bit. Now with the last bit, so why some viruses lead to pandemics and others don't. Honestly, this is a really difficult <laughs> question to explain to a 10 year old. And I think that you gave quite a decent answer for probably your first try at a DTEC. So the way that I would approach a question like this is that I would break it down. So the child probably now knows what a virus is, but they probably don't exactly know what a pandemic is as well. You did get to that towards the end of your answer, but it's probably good to clarify that at the start. So for example, you could say a pandemic is when a lot of people around the world, right? Because remember the definition of pandemic is worldwide, get sick with the virus or the bug. So now that you've laid the foundation for your answer, you can then go, and describe why some viruses cause pandemics and others don't. Once again, I think that you have to be a little bit wary about some words that you use. So for example, like death rate and incurable, those are probably not words that you wanna be using with a 10 year old. Cause you know, you don't wanna scare the kid while they're getting their vaccine. <laughs> Once again, just think about the basic principles, right? So we know COVID-19 has a really long incubation period and a lot of people are also asymptomatic. They don't actually have any symptoms. So what you can say is like, oh, sometimes these bugs, the bug is using you to spread to other people. And then a few weeks later, it comes out and it makes you sick. That's how you can kind of describe how pandemics occur because they're spreading a lot and they're hiding within people. And that just like paints a picture in the child's mind as to how this pan, like what a pandemic is and why these bugs are able to cause a pandemic. So that was that basic feedback. One more point that I'd like to bring up in relation to content okay, is that it's really important to stay on track. So it's really easy to, I think, you know, it's good points, right? So you said that it's good to tell the child to be aware, spread the message, prevent the spread. That's really good to say, but it's not exactly relevant to the questions that I've asked either. So if there was another question or maybe in the first question, you could kind of mention it, but don't focus too much on that. So I just want to quickly touch on structure as well. So I think your mannerisms were really good and that's really important. 
And one big piece of advice I can give for DTech in general is that just start off by explaining who you are. So, hi, my name's Sanji, and say what you're, going, you're here today to do. So, I'm here to explain this word to you. And if at any point you don't understand, feel free to stop me and I'll re-explain. Now, the reason I say that is because we literally do the same thing in medicine. Like before doing a clinical exam, we'll introduce ourselves, we'll explain everything to the patient so they know that they're on board. And you want the same goal with your interviewer. It just shows that you're not a robot that's explaining words to the examiner. You're a human, you're treating them like a human, and you and the examiner together are working towards that ultimate goal of helping them understand a concept. In regards to structure, the last bit I would say is that don't use scientific words to explain scientific words. So you don't want to add layer upon layer because then you'll just be explaining yourself through it and you don't have enough time. So for example, like with the immune system, don't say that the immune system is made out of T cells and B cells and then explain what T cells and B cells are. Just use a simple analogy like the immune system are the soldiers of your body. So I was focusing a lot on structure and the reason why I focus on structure is because it makes you seem more concise seems more knowledgeable and more understandable throughout. So it's really important. So once again, everyone is going to say the right thing, but it's how you say it that you can really make a difference. So I'm just going to end by giving you some basic tips just in general. And I think that this is just important and it can spread to, to all types of stations that you do. And you'll find that, you know, the content structure, presentation format, okay, that's the kind of feedback that you want to be looking at and thinking about when you're, whenever you're doing a station. So the first thing I'm going to say is don't be afraid to pause. Okay, I remember one station, I took 10 seconds to pause because it was so complicated. But when I gave my answer, the interviewer, like, he looked surprised because I'm pretty sure that most people, they would have just started talking right away and they wouldn't have given a really clear, nice answer. So take a moment. Don't be afraid to take a moment. It shows the interviewer that you're considering things and you're not rushing into things, just like you do in real life. The last thing that I'll just say is that, and this is what I started with as well, right? The humor bit. This is a formal interview, but you're not a robot. If you can add some humor, that would be great. If you have some time at the end, like we did, so for example, we had two minutes at the end, ask about the weather, ask about sports, ask about your train right here, and you know, just be a normal human being. And at the end of the day, okay, remember that you're a human. So I remember one of the stations that I sat at an MMI. After the bell rung, I didn't just like thank the examiner and leave. So while she was packing up, I asked her how her day had been. You know, I asked her about, you know, how long she'd be sitting in the room. And it turns out that she was sitting there the entire day. So I thanked her for taking the time out of her day, you know, to interview us and, you know, give me an opportunity to get into medicine. This kind of thing didn't give me marks, right? She'd already closed her iPad. I wasn't going to get anything out of it. But at the end of the day, like you're a human, right? So you want to be practicing that empathy. You want to like, you know, embody it. It's not just for your interviews. It's for your life. And literally that's what you're going to be doing every day as a doctor. So that's kind of how you should be acting now. As you can tell, we are so very grateful to have fantastic examiners who give the most thorough and thoughtful advice. If you're prepping for any GEMSAS interviews, we specifically run mock MMI rounds just for the GEMSAS unis, and the link will be in the show notes below if you want to check that out. But until then, see you on the next station.